All right. Um, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nandi Lutuli and I work for AVAC as a regional stakeholder engagement manager and I'm based in Johannesburg, South Africa. We are expecting a little bit more people to join, but in the interest of time, I think uh, we can go ahead and start and um, given that we only have an hour to, uh, for this webinar. Uh, on behalf of AVAC, I'd like to welcome you all to the second session of the Research Engagement Series on HIV Prevention Ethics. Uh, this call is part of AVAC's research literacy effort called the Research Engagement Series, and it's the sec second call um, in the series. The primary objective of the series is to develop research literacy for advocates and civil society and facilitate uh, the engagement of advocates and civil society with current in future trials uh, with increasing complex um, designs. In today's session, we are going to focus on the newly revised UNAIDS WHO ethical guidance for HIV prevention that were released at the 2021 R4P virtual conference, as well as the HP10 um, guidance, guidelines uh, that were released in uh, 2020. In particular, we are going to look at these two uh, ethical guidance for HIV prevention trials uh, in people and try to understand what has changed and why these changes matter. Um, I'd like to just go over a, a few housekeeping rules before we start. Um, I'd, I'd like to remind you uh, all that this call is being recorded. Uh, please feel free to let us know if you have any objections uh, to us recording this session. Secondly, uh, we'd, like to, we'd like this call to be engaging and want to encourage you all uh, to please raise your hands if you have any questions. Uh, for our panelists or uh, use the chat to write down any questions or comments that you might have. And uh, Daisy and I will make sure that your questions and comments are raised and addressed. Lastly, I'd like to remind you all to kindly keep your lines muted and uh, only unmute your line when, you are, uh, when you've been asked uh, by our moderator to speak or um, to ask a question or a comment. So we are going to start off uh, with the polling question. And you'll be given uh, three multiple choice answers to choose from. Uh, Jackie, can you please pull up uh, the poll for us? Fantastic. So uh, the question is, how familiar are you with the revised UNAIDS WHO as well as the HP10 ethical guidelines? So you have uh, three answers to choose from um, and you're only allowed to choose one. The first answer is not at all. I have not looked at the, doc at the documents. The second option is somewhat familiar. So I know about them and have read a summary. And then the last uh, option is I'm very familiar. So I know them a lot and I refer to them in my day-to-day -day work or activities. I would like you all to please choose one choice that sort of resonates with you and your familiarity with these two um, ethical guidance. Thank you. So we'll give you all about a minute or so to sort of uh, read through the question and respond uh, or choose one of the answers from the three. And then uh, it'd be interesting to sort of see uh, how familiar folks are with these two um, ethical guiding documents. And Nandi, I wanted to also add that if none of these answers resonate with you, you can add something in the chat <laughs> for further comment. Thank you. Thanks, Daisy. And also, it's anonymous. I think most people know that with Zoom polls, right? But you won't get tested, <laughs> depending on your answer. So maybe another 30 more seconds? All right, and Jackie, please feel free to share the results with us uh, once they are available.
All right, so uh, over 51%, about 51% of you are not familiar with these documents at all. 43% uh, are somewhat uh, familiar with uh, these documents and we have about 6% that sort of use these uh, or refer to these documents on their day-to-day -day work. So this is excellent and fantastic. And the reason why really we, we as AVEC thought it would be important for us to sort of have this webinar and sort of talk through uh, these two guiding documents and what they mean for us as communities, advocates, CAB members, and civil society and how we can sort of use them uh, as, as you know, uh, clinical trials are sort of changing, right? In the new era of PrEP, uh, there's a lot going on. So I think this is um, uh, an, a really great opportunity for us to sort of engage with our panelists. And we hope that uh, this session will be informative and valuable and that it will help you, uh, you know, get familiar with these two documents. Um, we're also hoping that this session will provide a space for all of you guys to sort of grapple with these um, new ethics uh, recommendations, as well as the potential impact that these guiding documents will have on current and upcoming trials. I am now going to hand it over to Stacey Hanna from AVAC, who directs the research engagement team. Uh, Stacey is going to tell us uh, a bit more about our agenda, the purpose of the call, as well as tell us about um, our lovely, amazing panelists that we have on the call. Over to you, Stacey. Okay, thank you so much, Nandi. Um, and um, really excited to, to be with everyone for this second session of the research engagement um, series. You can hear me okay, right? Yeah, okay. Um, I, uh, and you know, we've got a really great group on the line, which I think um, really speaks to the level of interest in these two documents. So excited to get the conversation going. I'm gonna go ahead and just um, uh, kick it over to, uh, to um, Professor Kathy Slack, who is gonna open us up with sort of a framing presentation and just to try to help orient everyone um, on the call. Obviously 51% of us uh, um, are not familiar with these documents at all. So I think it's important to kind of start with a bit of an orientation. Um, and so we're, we're looking forward to, to hearing from, from her and uh, I won't preface any of what she's going to present. I'm sure she's gonna do a very um, excellent job of that herself. And then we're gonna hear um, a, a, a bit from a couple of sort of expert uh, speakers uh, representatives from both uh, WHO, UNAIDS, as well as the HPTN, and I'll um, I'll get, I'll introduce them when we when we get there, and just hear some kind of opening thoughts from the two of them. But then really uh, spend a bulk of the of the time uh, doing a, a question and answer with with you all, the participants. And um, I, I know we've had some some previous conversations with a lot of you on the line, and so we know that there are some some questions to be asked. So um, that's really the, uh, the, the, the agenda for the call. And so without further ado, I am going to pass over to, to Professor Kathy Slack. I think um, most people on the line are familiar with her. Uh, Kathy is the head of the HIV AIDS Vaccine Ethics Group, HAVEG, based at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in Peter Maritzburg, South Africa. Um, and just have a wealth of experience looking at ethics around uh, vaccine trials and uh, HIV prevention trials. So, and I know has been involved in, in the update of, of these, uh, these guidelines and has been looking at them for, for a while since, since the update, updates have been going on. So, um, Kathy, over to you. Thank you so much, Stacey, and thank you, Nandi and Daisy, for um, inviting me to be here. And good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Just to say that Stacey gave me a, um, um, a promotion to professorship, so I'm actually not a professor, but um, thanks for that, Stacey. Um, I'm going to go off camera just because of bandwidth. Um, I hope you'll forgive me. I've got 15 minutes, and um, I'm going to just use seven slides. And in this talk, I'm really going to focus on three main issues. The first is um, the engagement or involvement of community and stakeholders in this important research, the standard of prevention that should be ensured for participants in trials, 
um, and the issue of post-trial access to beneficial um, interventions for participants and communities. So you'll know that obviously there were so many issues to choose from. Um, I did make choices and hopefully these choices will be of interest to advocates. Uh, next slide, please, Jan. So in this talk, I'm going to use two questions really to guide the material. Um, and they are firstly, uh, what are the recommendations contained in the dedicated named guidance points for these issues? So it's not what is said in the entire book or the two sets of booklets on the issues. So I'm really focusing on the, the dedicated guidance points. I've looked for possible synergies um, just because I think that might be helpful for advocates working in the field. Secondly, the second question guiding the talk is really what is the role of engagement as envisaged by these guidance points, especially um, engagement of advocates and civil society. So in addition to the role that you envisage because of your organizational mandates, for example, what is the role as envisaged by the ethics guidance? So on the left are the UNAIDS ethics guidelines and on the right are the HPTN ethics guidelines. I'm just gonna look at these two. And there are people in the room that were actually involved in drafting both, which is really great for us. Um, next slide, please. So before we start, just some general considerations. Um, if you look at the column um, on the far left, I'm gonna look at the audience, the scope and the approach of these two guidelines. And I'm just gonna say that they're not identical. So these two sets, these two booklets don't necessarily address exactly the same audience and have the exact same scope or even take the same approach. But having said that, there are synergies. So if you look at row one, the audience, um, you'll see that UNAIDS um, sees that it is trying to reach or it sees as its audience all partners who develop, implement, review trials, and they give a long list and they specifically include community members in the intended audience. They see this as all partners, regardless of the organizational affiliation, regardless of the setting, regardless of the country that you're in. So this is like on the planet um, and it casts a very wide net. HPTN sees as its primary audience those affiliated to HPTN, but it does acknowledge a secondary audience as um, the prevention field more broadly. If you look at row two, scope, you'll see that UNAIDS tends to confine itself to trials of new biomedical um, modalities. If you look a little bit further down the row, you'll see HPTN is concerned with HIV prevention research more broadly, including trials, but not limited to trials. Also having behavioral studies as its focus and implementation research. If you look at row three, the approach, HPTN, I mean, sorry, UNAID sets both um, normative standards, um, so substantive recommendations, but also processes to try and get to standards. Um, and if you look further down the row, HPTN highlights uh, this distinction between um, responsibilities that are obligatory. In other words, they're necessary, they must be done, and they're usually recognized by words like must or should. And then on the other hand, ethical aspirations, which um, tend to be recognized by words like strive to, for example. So HPTN also goes out of its way to state which party is responsible for, for which actions. UNAIDS does this often, but not always. Um, and UNAIDS does sometimes say must and should on the one hand, and then on the other hand, it might say could, but it's really not organized around this distinction between obligations and aspirations. So, if you stand back, while both of the guidelines give direction on ethical issues, they don't have identical audiences or scope or approach. Um, they both recognize that their guidance points have to be applied in context. Um, and there are some synergies that I think you might be interested in as advocates, despite the sort of non-identical approaches. Next slide, please. So looking at the first issue, um, this is labeled community partnership by UNAIDS and it's labeled community engagement by HPTN. And those are the specific guidance points there you can see in red. 
So if you look at the first row, uh, row goals, um, in terms of the ethical rationale for engagement, the goals, the hoped for outcomes of engagement, both guidance points really hope that it will achieve ethical and scientific outcomes. It's really rooted in these ethical and scientific outcomes. So UNAIDS reaches for clearer study outcomes, smoother research, better stakeholder understanding and capacity in negotiating power, improved trust, et cetera. And UNAIDS mentions things like science is reaching for scientific soundness, ethical soundness, appropriateness, trust, amongst others. So really rooting, they're both really rooted in trying to achieve these ethical and scientific goals. Um, if you look at row two, both guidance points expect engagement to be early and sustained across the life cycle. So UNAIDS uses words like from the outset and having a continuum forum. And HPTN uses wording like early and in all phases of the research. If you look at row three, both guidance points expect that engagement should be broad and diverse. So if you look, UNAIDS will say there must be engagement of communities that will participate in the trial plus other, others that are affected. And it explicitly lists civil society advocates. And uh, UN, uh, HPTN says um, that Community stakeholders are important, but also other relevant stakeholders, including representatives of agencies and organizations most affected. So this is not on the slide, but obviously both will encourage a range of, act, of actions to try and achieve these goals, including, for example, how to set up advisory mechanisms like CAGs. This is also not on the slide, but there are some, one difference worth mentioning is um, that HBTN specifically encourages diversity in study leadership and diversity in study teams in order to be able to, to realize its engagement recommendations. Standing back, I don't see major tensions across these guidance points such that stakeholders would be, for example, confused. I think you could use both in a complementary way to try and give useful, um, useful direction. Next slide, please. So looking at the second issue, this is the issue of standard of prevention, as many of you will be familiar with this, with this issue and this debate. So this tends to refer to the responsibility, well, responsibilities of researchers and sponsors to ensure that participants access methods to prevent HIV infection, um, existing methods. And you'll know that participants often live in settings or reside in settings where there's imperfect access to these tools. And it raises questions of how far researchers must go when others can't or, or won't ensure access. And also, um, if participant access of tools is very high or very good, then it can affect the power of the, of the trial to detect efficacy of the modality of interest. And that can waste resources and it can also set back the needs of at-risk citizens who need prevention products. So the tension here for researchers is to ensure that participants access tools while simultaneously supporting efficacy assessment through having these adequately powered studies. So it's not an easy issue. Um, if you look at row one, the standard, the UNAIDS guidance point states that participants should have access to, and the phrase they use is WHO recommended methods. So they argue that WHO, the WHO recommendation process is rigorous and it takes into account not only scientific evidence, but also costs, uh, issues of cost and issues of feasibility. The HPTN guidance point asserts that um, participants should be able to access modalities that are known effective. Um, in other words, there's good evidence. They're practically achievable. Um, in other words, it's implementable and sustainable without the research and reasonably accessible, which they use the words free or at cost, safe and legal. Now these, you'll recognize that these two standards are closer together than they have been in many, many years. Um, because UNAID used to be state of the art. So they're closer together, but they're not identical. If you look at row two, um, this is about when the guidance points would allow for there to be a deviation or a departure from the standard. UNAID requires, in my view, three little, three steps. They're sort of, it's like a three-part algorithm. There has to be a compelling reason, compelling rationale, that is scientific biological manufacturing, but also where um, somebody voluntarily refuses 
um, the modality or fails to use it for clinical reasons. So that's a fourth sort of reason, but there has to be compelling rationale that has to be accepted by stakeholders after meaningful engagement. And then the last part is that it has to be approved by, by RSD. HPTN allows that there can be a departure from known effective. In all fairness, they don't use the language of standard and then there's departure. They rather use the language of necessary and sufficient, but they do um, suggest that um, if there was a, if providing a, a modality would demonstrate radical superiority over that available to non-participants, then that might be a consideration for not adding it to the package. If you look at um, row three, this is in terms of what stakeholder engagement practices are recommended. There really are a lot, and I'm, I think this might be of most interest to this group. The UNAIDS, the guidance point, recommends consulting stakeholders to add new methods as they're endorsed by WHO and engaging and securing agreement from stakeholders to deviate. So those first two bullets are cons consultation to add and consultation to not add. Um, and then lastly, um, involving stakeholders in monitoring um, the, uh, the uptake of, of, of such modality. HPTN also recommends consulting stakeholders to address the issue and also recommends that researchers act as resources to add so standing back again, the standards are closer than they've been for well over a decade, but they're not the same. And we're going to have to test these against a concrete emerging example. But both guidance points really set the expectation of involvement of stakeholders, um, such as advocates. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So this is the, the final issue. It's the issue of post-trial access to interventions by participants and then obviously certain non-participants, so certain sort of moral groups within non-participants. And if you look at row one in terms of the recommendations, so UNAIDS recommends that the, the researchers and sponsors have to have a plan. They um, make the recommendation that there should be provision of continued access um, to participants of of interventions proven beneficial. And then they make a statement, which I'm just going to read, to make intervention, to make the intervention reasonably available to the population where it exists, can be sustained as a basic ethical requirement. Um, so that's the position they take. If you look at HPTN, um, they argue that it is you have to have a uh, researchers and sponsors must have a preliminary plan for participants in the communities, and that's seen as an obligation. Um, and then um, the, the, they argue that to pro actually ensure provision of a successful intervention to those three groups um, would really be deemed as aspirational. So there, is some, there are some tensions here, um, or I, in my view. So UNAIDS really seeing the provision of the intervention as kind of a basic requirement to use their words, whereas HPTN perhaps sees it as aspirational to use their words. Moving to row two, there's several factors cited by both guidance points. And this is really important because these considerations would impact the responsibility to ensure provision. So these would be considered non-spurious reasons. Um, UNAID cites the regulatory approval pathway, um, having acceptable, the availability of acceptable alternatives in the healthcare system and also impact on quality of life. And HPTN argues that you would need to consider these are almost things that are outside of the network's control, things like regulatory approval, production, scale up, but then they also add others, including um, long term efficacy and safety. So these would be the con considerations that would need to be taken really seriously in making a determination. This is not on the slide, but um, both guidance point recommend lots of actions to try and address this issue. The UNAID says you must that they must, researchers must initiate a process of discussion. They must address key issues in the discussion. HPTN says that researchers must anticipate this issue. They must deliver, develop a preliminary plan. Um, and they must update and refine this plan over time. And they must address key issues in the plan. So there's a lot of really helpful guidance, including HPTN um, drawing a distinction between lower resource commitments and higher resource commitments and having some really good recommended practices for both of those scenarios. 
So moving to row three, what stakeholder engagement practices are recommended. UNAIDS encourages consulting stakeholders, involving them in discussions and in agreeing on a plan. And HPTN encourages partnering with institutions to advocate for access. So standing back in terms of these standards, there is, um, a, is some tension, but both encourage engagement of stakeholders um, to, to address the issues. And I think that's a major emerging synergy. Next slide, please. So this is my final slide. And just in terms of a possible way forward, just two ideas. Firstly, the question of how could advocates help realize these recommendations in practice? So for example, are there structures and processes both, lo both local or international that could best accommodate the inputs of, of advocates? Um, obviously these might look different in different settings and we may need to experiment with various approaches and be flexible because um, often guidelines will be formulated at quite a high level of abstraction um, and which will accommodate quite a lot of flexibility in terms of how they're realized and secondly could advocates help identify limitations to guidance so for example is there a complexity that advocates identify that the guidelines just don't speak to so obviously guidelines cannot cover every situation, else they'd be a thousand pages long, but is there some thorny issue for which that, that advocates are grappling with that the guidelines themselves are silent on? And if that's the case, I think it's really important to try and give feedback to guideline developers so that they can just consider whether those issues should be in a future revision. So that, that really brings me to the end of the talk. I'm a little bit over time, I apologize for that. And thanks very much for your attention. <clears throat> Thank you so much, um, Kathy. I think that was just a really um, such a nice summary of some of the key guidance points and um, uh, from from both documents and comparison, um, as well as I loved the kind of the uh, the sort of how to put this in practice and what are some of the, the ways forward. And um, before we move on, there has been a little bit of discussion in the chat. I think um, <clears throat> some questions about, um, you know, some of the different conceptualization between community and stakeholder engagement versus um, partnership. And um, I, I think some of that is being answered in the chat, but happy to carry that through into the Discussion. Before we move on, there is this, um, I don't know if you can answer this quickly, Kathy, but there's a question, if you could say more about how the two guidelines were further apart before um, on the standard of prevention. Yes. I think you mentioned, yeah. yeah. If you could just speak to that quickly. Yes, certainly. So if you'll probably, you may remember this, but the 2007 version, which was then updated with the guidance point for IDU in 2012, that really took the stance that participants that are enrolled in studies deserved access to state-of-the-art prevention. Mm. So state-of-the-art wasn't actually defined in the guidance, but mm. it linked itself to the interpretation that that was like the best worldwide prevention. So it could be seen that way. So the, the best available prevention package anywhere on the planet. There were some criticisms of it, including in the, in fact, the, some of the best critiques of it are found in the HPTN guidance, the current guidance, because that was um, part of what that guidance was trying to respond to, was that, was that particular state of the art standard. And they give a few reasons for why that standard was, could be seen as sort of infeasible in practice. Um, and they argue, for example, that some prevention modalities um, that are seen as state-of-the-art could be culturally unacceptable, um, and they could also be illegal. Um, they, they could also be so um, sort of radically superior, um, introduce these really um, radical inequities um, between participants and non-participants. So they were, in a sense, positioning, and of course, there are people in the room that can talk to this better than I, but they were, um, in a sense, arguing for their known effective standard and the others, known effective, practically achievable, reasonably available, um, that it was almost a response to that state of the art. 
I hope I've answered your question. So definitely with the new WHO recommended with its concerns around feasibility and its concerns around cost, at least having a head nod to those things, the, the standards are closer than they've been before. But I'm very happy for others to, to lean in here, like Jeremy or Andreas or any of the others. Thank you, Kathy. And, and maybe we can kind of circle, circle back to that a little bit more in the discussion. I think, um, obviously, I think that's sort of a key area of focus for all of this. And, um, you know, especially, the, obviously, the reason these, um, these guidelines were updated is because that standard of prevention is changing so much in the way those uh, the standard gets incorporated into trials is changing so much. Um, so I think that's a um, perfect basis for ongoing conversation. Um, and obviously sort of, I think a key, one of these sort of gray areas and one of the reasons that it is so important for communities and advocates to be involved in these, in these discussions. So I'm gonna kick to the next part of the agenda. And um, this is where we're gonna hear from a, a couple more experts in the field. Um, just, just very briefly, not presentations, but just some, um, some, some initial commentary. Um, and our first, uh, our first expert uh, panelist is Dr. Andreas Rice, uh, who is the co-lead of, um, of the global health uh, and ethics team in the division of the chief scientist at the WHO and has really a, a wealth of experience looking at ethics kind of across across public health and, um, and obviously is, has been quite involved in, in the UNAIDS guidelines. And then we also have uh, Dr. Jeremy Sugarman um, and he is uh, the Harvey M. Meyerhoff Professor of Bioethics and Medicine at the Berman Institute of Bioethics and School of Medicine at Johns Hopkins University. Um, I think many people uh, know Jeremy and love to hear him, hear him speak. Uh, um, and also just to note that he is the, the chair of the HPTN ethics working group. So I think a perfect person to, to be speaking with us on, um, on this. And I do believe we have him. I, I believe Daisy can, yes. Okay. Yeah, we do have him fine. online. I don't see him. Okay, great. Hi. Um, he is actually joining us rushing in between clinic this morning. So we're especially happy to have him. So. Great to see you, Jeremy. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna start off uh, with a couple questions for each of you and I'll start with you, Andreas. If, first, if you could just uh, speak to how these, uh, the newly revised uh, ethical considerations from UNAIDS are being promoted among regulators and, and trialists. Okay, first of all, uh... Thank you very much for the invitation to this uh, meeting. I am really happy um, that we have this opportunity for discussion. It's very important that the uh, WHO UNAIDS guide uh, guidelines uh, don't just sit on the shelf in Geneva, but that we are engaging with uh, um, communities on, on these guidelines. And so I'm, I'm very thankful to, to be here. And uh, I do think that the updating of the guidance was uh, really uh, necessary and timely because it had been since, it was already mentioned, since 2007 essentially, and then uh, a modification 2012, that these guidelines hadn't been revised. And that's quite a long time you know, in, in such a quickly evolving field, so over 10 years. Um, so this was uh, really uh, um, you know, timely and, and, and necessary. So uh, the guide, guidance was uh, launched uh, already at the uh, HIV R4P uh, conference in January. Uh, which is uh, really a big forum uh, specifically on this issue, along with an article in, in JAMA, which is always also good for dissemination. Um, our unit uh, at WHO on uh, health ethics and governance works a lot with uh, national research ethics committees. And um, in fact, we're organizing the Global Summit of National Research um, Ethics Committees every two years and uh, have a huge distribution list. So um, we sent the document to all of these uh, committees and asked them to distribute them uh, in turn to their local ethics uh, committees. And then we uh, offered to uh, organize webinars with these uh, committees. Um, we 
have uh, one particular um, webinar that was hosted by the ASEAN uh, National Research Ethics Committees, which uh, is uh, about 30 uh, committees, uh, where uh, Peter Godfrey Fawcett and, and others uh, spoke to the guidelines. Um, and we're also planning a special session at the next Global Summit of National Ethics Committees, which unfortunately has been postponed due to um, COVID. Um, otherwise, of course, the WHO Ethics Review Committee is also um, working with these new guidelines, and they have also given the input, uh, very important input into that. And um, there are a number of other uh, ways we, we could uh, disseminate these guidance points, especially also in the um, HIV um, world where I'm, I'm not an expert. But I would also like to hear from the uh, um, from the people here what would be most useful for you. I think it was very interesting to have this uh, um, initial question, and it shows that I think uh, more activities like like this one are certainly uh, needed in in uh, for fora like this. And it would be important also to hear for us uh, what you think what WHO and UNAIDS could uh, offer, um, including also through our regional office, uh, maybe in Africa or uh, in countries to uh, help further disseminate this guidance. Over. Excellent, thank you. And um, I think also given sort of the global, the global reach of the, of the UNAIDS guidelines, uh, it's a really important, um, conversation and again I think it is it's so hard especially with just you know guidelines like this to make sure that they they actually do get implemented so happy to continue that conversation as well uh, so over to you Jeremy uh, wondering from you um, to switching to the HBTN uh, ethics ethical guidance what's the rationale for a research network to develop its own guidelines. And um, if you could comment a little bit about how you see the HPTN guidelines kind of intersecting with those from, from UNAIDS, as well as the OMS and the, and the ICH guidelines. Great, thanks. And, and thanks for organizing this and, and everyone for joining. And, and um, obviously in an hour, um, we can only just touch the surface of this. And, and first, thanks, Kathy, for a lightning overview. Um, and Kathy was only able to cover sort of three domains of the entire life cycle of research related to HIV prevention. So uh, both sets of guidelines um, cover a, an extraordinary range of, of research, starting from its very beginnings to why we need H HIV prevention research, even though we have some available products, to all the way to the end to post-trial dissemination. And so we could spend you know, a significant amount of time talking about any one of these guidance points. And I think that's important to keep in mind. So uh, try not to take as the lesson, just the sound bites of, of one of the guidance points and how they compare and contrast, really take them. Both documents are available for free. No one gets royalties, download them, use them, comment on them, engage with them, partner with them. Um, I it really, um, it's just the really the beginning. So we wanna make you aware that both of these guidelines Guidances are sort of tasty in their own ways, um, and they each have some strengths and they each have some weakness, and and it's just you know feast on them. Um, okay, so with that said, why did the HPTN do this? So the HPTN, um, the HIV Prevention Trials Network, is a global network that conducts HIV prevention research of all types around the globe, um, and we started this process in two thousand and three, uh, and of course I wasn't born then. Well, I guess I was. But um, we started this process in 2003 when there were conflicting um, guidance documents across the globe for HIV prevention research. And you should really keep in mind at the time, we had almost all of our prevention trials were failed, okay? So we were, we were trying so many things. Now, the only thing that was effective at the time um, for HIV prevention, which was stunningly effective, effective though, was the prevention of maternal child transmission. Right, we had those studies that led to international controversies. So our investigators and our sponsors were trying to conduct the actual research and they were conflicting. If they looked at UNAIDS document, they looked at Nuremberg, they looked at SIAMS, they got conflicting guidance and they said, they're all ethics guidance documents. What am I supposed to do? How am I ethically gonna conduct my research? 
And so we took this on and it was a, a partnership of people engaged in HIV ethics globally, uh, community partners, um, scientists, um, all involved in trying to figure out how do we navigate this really complicated space. Because of the nature of HIV and the, the populations and people it affects in the parts of the globe that are most desperately affected, we really needed to be nuanced to the actual realities. That's not saying we're compromising ethical standards in any way. It means that we, we also don't wanna put people in the position of saying that there was an ethical requirement that there was absolutely no way they could meet. Um, so we wanted to tease out the distinction between aspirational, which is something really desirable. It doesn't mean it goes away from things that are absolutely morally required, like consent, okay? Um, so um, that's the rationale for that. And it was really to facilitate it. And it was informed by the sensitivities and practical experience. Sometimes when we, I think it's always hubris to, to gather anywhere in the globe in one room, apart from where research is actually being conducted and then announcing ethics guidance, or it's just, it, there's no other way around it. Now we do it by Zoom or another platform. But I think that's the difference largely if you were to compare the documents. Um, and I think that's, maybe I should stop there and, and get the questions. But I, on that question that came up in the chat about the prior version of standard prevention, Kathy, I think you did a great job answering that question. Um, but I think it was in a time of failure um, that we were, we were um, dealing with the question of standard of prevention and also the practical reality of doing it. Now we have so many things in the HIV prevention toolbox and we, um, we need to be able to say, do we, do we actually need to, to um, give all of these things to everyone? Not every, you don't need all of these preventive modalities and there are some practical barriers. And if you want, I can talk about the post-trial access distinction um, or not, I'll just be quiet now um, and get your questions and we can uh, engage to the extent that's helpful to you. So thanks again for doing this. Thank you, Jeremy. And that, uh, the, the history of the, the kind of the HPTN and their ethical ethics guidance is, is super helpful in sort of understanding this update and, um, and, and I think the thinking of the network around these issues. So um, thanks for that. I do know we've got um, we've got questions and and hopefully answers. Um, I'm going to pass over to my colleague Daisy Oya from from AVAC, who is going to moderate this 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 part of it. Uh, thank you so much, Stacey. Um, so we have about 15 minutes, and I can see a hand up. So without further ado, uh, we'll call on Ethel to to un unmute herself and uh, ask the question, please. Thanks. Thanks so much, Daisy. This is Ethel from IALV. Um, I, I, I had a question. So we've, we've recognized that the process for reviewing the ethics uh, guidance has taken quite some time. I mean, over a decade and HIV prevention research is a very fast moving um, field and getting more complicated now more than ever. Um, and my question is, is, wouldn't there be value in having like a sort of a regular, um, like regular time period for uh, reviewing the documents? Is, is that something that, that can be done to have regular conversations to check and see whether the document uh, still speaks to the situation as it is, as it evolves? So I, I think that's a great, a great question. And um, yeah, so this was the third revision of the um, HPTN ethics guidance document. We did 2003, 2009, and then uh, this version. And in fact, given the COVID pandemic um, and we're, we're thinking of, and some also some people have pointed out in the chat difference in language, right? The language shifts around what is the appropriate language to describe uh, different um, aspects of HIV prevention research, community partnership and the like. And so we're uh, considering doing a, um, just an update, not a revision right now, um, just in light of, of those changes. But we, we, look, we tend to look periodically and probably about in every five year cycle. It's a hugely laborious process. Um, Andreas can tell you uh, uh, their process was even longer than ours. Um, they were, we were expecting to come out about the same time. Uh, ours came out about a year before, uh, 11 months before, 
but the more process and the more process and more people you engage, the longer the process. And so uh, it, there's a tension there. Yeah, if I may, may add from WHO's perspectives, so normally WHO guidelines uh, should be updated every five years now, but of course uh, we can, you know, also react to some uh, drastic developments uh, or, you know, in, in COVID it takes sometimes only a couple of weeks to get out uh, guidance. So, you know, if there's any particular need felt uh, to uh, revise earlier, we can certainly react to that. But as uh, Jeremy said, it's uh, quite a laborious uh, process. Um, so, you know, it typically takes a year or, or even two to uh, finalize a guidance document. Over. Thank you so much, Dr. Andreas. Yeah, indeed. Um, yeah, especially when you have to uh, become, be inclusive with the revisions, uh, then it becomes a very um, a big process. Um, so I have, uh, I can see a question from uh, Chilufia. Um, Chilufia, would you like to unmute yourself and ask it? Thank you. Sure. This is Chilufia from Zambia. So I, I have a question. Um, how are the UNAIDS uh, WHO ethical guidelines informing the design and conduct of trials, for instance, the MEC and Gilead designs for long acting prep? Uh, this is of interest for me, especially for MEC, which is soon to start, and now the guidelines have just been uh, revised. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that question. I'm afraid I cannot really speak to that because I don't uh, you know, work in the HIV or UNAIDS uh, departments. I don't know, maybe my, my colleagues uh, uh, know something about that? So I think we um, anticipated that there'd be a need for new designs, but again, what the new designs are. And I think, I think actually the UNAIDS document uh, outlines at the outset um, some of the tensions that could be anticipated um, in using new designs. And we have a guidance point on trial design and in the sense that what we want to ensure is that any research is only ethically sound if it's scientifically sound. And so the central piece is obviously the HPTN is not conducting these trials or participating in these trials, um, but the concern would be if we were to apply the HPTN guidelines, we would have to ensure that there was at the outset first all of the aspects of those trial design, you know, the trial would have to be uh, comporting with the fact that it's going to meet a social need, that, that it's scientifically sound and the like. And so I would, I would not, I would probably frame it as how do the current guidelines address the salient points of each of these trials as they're being designed, right? So they still adhere, even though the design has changed. None of, neither sets of guidelines say, you need a sample size of this, you need a power calculation that does this, or, or you have to use this kind of placebo, right? What they're saying is you have to ensure that the science is good and that you're meeting a social need. Both, of, both sets of guidelines address those. Um, so Sorry, I, could I just respond as well, just to say, just to say it's Kathy here. Um, I think the answer is that nobody can really speak for those exact PI and study teams, but as advocates and knowing what you do now, for example, about some of the key standards, for example, around standard of prevention, these are perhaps questions you could ask when you are engaging with them. And there are even um, things to try and look for if you get the chance to see protocol or support materials. Um, because I think you now know um, some of the sort of top line issues that perhaps should be um, addressed. But I don't think we can speak uh, precisely. I certainly can't speak precisely for whether um, what, what those exact study teams are doing. Thanks. Mm -hmm. If I may add to this, uh, you know, WHO guidance documents and guidelines um, don't, you know, aren't, aren't uh, mandatory to be used, but they, they do have an aspirational, you know, uh, force. And uh, it's very important, um, the role given in the guidelines to communities and to research ethics committees is, is uh, very important and is crucial. And I, I, I would hope that uh, these new guidelines can be used as a strong tool 
for ethics committees, for community members to really, you know, um, claim for for access um, for um, you know scientifically and ethically uh, solid trials. And uh, so I'm I'm really hopeful that you can make good use of of these uh, guidelines. Over. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I th thank you for sharing the links to the three trials that uh, Chilufia was, was referring to. It's the very uh, interesting trials with uh, lots of uh, complicated, um, well, let's say novel uh, pr uh, designs, you know, and uh, it seems that they have aspects of them that maybe are not fully covered in maybe the HPTN and, HP and WHO UNH uh, guidance, for instance, there's the issue of uh, the recency assays, which is coming up very strongly, which I have not really seen on uh, in either guidance. There's also, uh, you know, the and to to Jeremy's point of you know scientific validity, and you know that's a, 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 at the back of our minds. You know, how can we make sure ethically that these trials can become uh, scientifically valid because they are, they have new new things, and maybe there's a chance, maybe there's an opportunity to make. A new guidance point on, you know, um, I know WHO units have something about scientific validity, but the guidance on how to use these recency assays and how to calculate the efficacy in 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 a in a realm where you are comparing two um, active products. But uh, thanks. So I will move on to another question that came on came in from uh, Jacinta Nyokabi. Uh, she says, uh, I would have wanted to hear more on the on our responsibility in results dissemination, since there seems to be a gap in community involvement around results dissemination. Perhaps, Jeremy, you can take that on. Sure, okay. And uh, yeah, just on your last point, Daisy, and I will uh, take a look at the section on uh, research design in the, the text of the um, research design in the HPTN guidelines. There's not specific, we don't call out specific assays or specific counterfactual groups, uh, recency assays. There's a debate going on in the literature and what's I think properly happening is places like the HIV forum are assembling groups with the people with the appropriate expertise to deliberate about those. But the general issues are there uh, to discuss. We problematize the issues and we anticipate the need that we may not be able to have classic RCTs, randomized trials. Um, in terms of dissemination, we agree completely um, that there needs to be dissemination. And this is something that's taken place, not just in, in HIV related research, but in research more broadly about making clinical trial results available broadly. So this is a, this is a, a, a global trend and it was one of the animating features of our, our wanting to go forward. Could we do a better job? Absolutely. Who are the group's best positioned to help with that? AVAC, um, groups like that, um, to be able to, to translate some of the research. Now, we've, we've done a good job. I can tell you, and we've been doing this for a while, um, in a older HPTN trial I was involved in, uh, HPTN 058, which involved uh, people who inject drugs in border regions of China and Thailand. Um, the principal investigator uh, uh, and a small team of us uh, with our community uh, group and went to the sites and we had dissemination events where we discussed the findings, um, built it into the study budget and did that. And that was uh, almost a decade ago. Um, and I can tell you it's very cold in some of those regions at the time we went, but um, it was a really interesting to, to engage in these conversations and, and do it. So we've been doing some of some of that. Can, can we do more? Absolutely. And, and one of the things we've been learning um, with the pandemic is how to exploit technologies in places where there's access to technologies to do this better, right? Where we used to think we had to have meetings and serve good food. We know that we can also use um, mobile phones. We can use web-based platforms. Again, not everybody has bandwidth, not everybody has access, those limitations side, but we should be looking for every way we can. Is it a radio show? Is it a play? Is it a, a, a community event? There are lots of ways of disseminating it. We should all be um, involved in trying to figure out better ways to do that and and telling stories about how we do that so others can learn from them. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah, but good food is a must, whichever technology we use. Totally. 
yeah. <laughs> um, so I think we are running really lo low on time. So I will let Julie and Grace in quick succession put their questions, uh, you know, ex express their questions and then we can maybe have a round of uh, responses and then we are going to unfortunately have to close the, the session at the top of the hour. So Julie, please go and then followed by Grace. Thanks. Thanks, Daisy. Um, I think it echoes a lot of what you were asking, but perhaps maybe um, Dr. Sugarman addressed um, my question, but maybe Dr. Race would like to answer just in terms of whether UNAIDS would consider who WHO recommended language around those kinds of standards uh, regarding background data as a comparator. And also um, we've bumped up against trials using different recency assays and just curious about that. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for thank that question. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, Grace, and then we, we, you can go, uh, Dr. Andreas. Okay, thank you so much, Daisy. So my question was basically, I think one of the challenges as advocates has been the definition of meaningful engagement. And I think what we've been asking for for so many years, and I, I know it's an odd engagement story, has been, uh, is the, are trialists basically planning well in terms of engaging communities? Are they resourcing it? But also not just getting away from once off engagement, basically. So my question was with the recommendations that have come out, are these issues clearly addressed in terms of the quality of engagement that needs to be happening? Thank you, Ova. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Andreas, you could go ahead, thanks. Yeah, if I can start with the um, second question, I think uh, the uh, engagement chapters were really uh, the ones or, or where we had most of the discussion and there were a lot of changes made uh, uh, based on the advice and input from a lot of community uh, um, stakeholders. And so I, I would hope that uh, the chapter now does uh, justice to these issues. But you know, if, if anyone from this group has uh, has any suggestions uh, how to even you know to improve it uh, next time if there are other aspects that need to be included uh, by all means please uh, you know, write to us and uh, um, you know this is is a living document and uh, you know we, we need to hear from you also about your your thoughts and, and feedback on the UNH uh, question unfortunately you know I, I work for WHO I, I cannot really comment on that. Um, it again seems like a very good idea, but I unfortunately, um, please write to me and I'm happy to uh, put you in touch with the UNAIDS uh, colleagues on, on that question. Over. That sounds great. Uh, thank you for the responses. I will hand it back to Stacy. I think because the time is not on our side to take us to the next couple of uh, items. Thank you. Well, I think the, the, um, the, the last couple of items are just to say, um, sorry, we, 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 as I've, I've heard rumors that AVAC is known to try to pack a lot into one hour. So that's what we tried to do here. We even tried to really focus it in on this specific discussion, but clearly there's so much more discussion to be had. I think that, um, you know, one thing that I just kind of wanted to wanted to point out in closing is just to recognize that there is a lot of work going on in this space. Um, I think especially around the new the next generation trial designs and many of us, I won't go through through the, the laundry list, but I think many of us have been um, engaged with with various discussions around that. Um, there is uh, AVAC does have a, a what we're what we're calling a trial design academy that's actually doing some pretty intensive engagement um, with, with the kind of the, the product developers now, and I think can also be a mechanism that we can continue this conversation. Um, and especially, I think this really critical issue of how do we, um, you know, how do we get these guidelines? How do we make sure that these guidelines don't just, just sit on a shelf? I think, especially in the case of, of UNAIDS where, um, uh, you know, it's such a such a such a wide audience, and maybe not the um, maybe not the not as clear of a, of a mechanism for application as the HBTN guidelines. So, um, 
definitely, uh, you know, look out for, for, for more engagement in that space. Um, you know, I would really just echo, I think, the, the sentiments of our, um, of all of our, of all of our speakers. Uh, this is an open conversation. Um, I think just because there are words written down on um, pages and not even, you know, hard copy pages, I think at this point, they are all just sort of living online. Um, you know, I think what we all recognize is that this is, first of all, it's a very uh, rapidly evolving space. And there is, there is gray area, especially I think as we see uh, new prevention options coming online. And these are really, really complicated issues. Um, so it's, it's, it's a space for continued discussion. I would even say continued partnership. I really loved, Jeremy, what you said. I can't remember the exact words, but something around the both of the documents being saucy and meaty. And, you know, just I think really this, what I heard so clearly was really an invitation for especially community advocates who are kind of living this day to day to, um, to, to to dig in to what these documents uh, what these documents lay out there and um, and engage and you can you can absolutely tasty thanks Jim they are tasty um, and you know absolutely I think AVAC is happy to to serve as a as a conduit so you know if if you have ongoing thoughts or questions about the documents please feel free to come to us or go directly to to any of the speakers that we've had here today, I'm sure that they would be um, open to that. Um, but I think just a huge thank you to everyone who's who's really participated um, and 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 spent their time here um, and just uh, watch this space for for further follow up uh, and stay tuned for also for the next session of the research engagement series. And I think we can can wrap there. Thank you all. Thank Have you. a lovely rest of your days wherever you are. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Same. you. Yeah. Bye-bye. The recording. Bye. Bye.